So as Roy was walking down, he very, in a Christ-like, brotherly manner, encouraged me and said, Top that, brother! <laughs> what a punk. You're already married. Uh, so I think, can we do that again? <laughs> um, so we go from a story of celebration to a personal story of chagrin. I was a youth pastor, and I was young, and I was pretty full of myself. And so I was in a parent meeting, and I had a thought, and as all verbal processors do, I started to speak my thought in a parent meeting, which may not have been the best idea. I said something to the effect of, I had this thought, I said, you know what, I don't really um, want to work on behavior management. I really don't want to work with your kids and helping change their behavior. And I just let that sit for a minute. And I was in a parent meeting and they all kind of stood up at that moment and like paid attention and said like, what? <laughs> and asked me a bunch of questions. And what was a very casual parent meeting turned into sort of a roast of my naivete and my inexperience and my unholiness and Thankfully, an elder stepped in and quickly asked me a series of questions to help figure out what I was trying to say. And so in that meeting with that group of parents, they came up with this word spiritual trajectory, which has sort of guided my youth pastor career ever since. A spiritual trajectory, um, the difficulty with student ministry is that amidst all the pizza, amidst all of the retreats with the really thin mattresses and the sore backs, amidst all of the conversations over fast food and dieting and have your wife look at you funny because you've been spiritually counseling people over fast food. It's, it's a real thing. Um, amidst all of the lock-ins and all that, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell when a student is actually growing. How do you know? Right, we can measure numbers like attendance on a Sunday morning or how many people come to small group or even how many people come to retreats. We can measure all sorts of things. We can measure how many people serve. We can measure all sorts of really good things. But how do you know if a student is really growing? I do know one thing. I know a few things. I know it's completely subjective. I know that this kid is different than this kid, which is different than their brother, and different than their sister, and different than that kid. I know that every kid gets to grow at their own speed and pace. I know that every kid gets to set their own trajectory. I know that I can't tell from up here. I can't help a kid grow. I can't nurture. We, as a church, cannot nurture their spiritual trajectory without knowing them without being in relationship with them, without spending time with them, without earning their trust to listen to them, without proving that we'll listen a whole lot more than we'll talk. Why does this matter to any of you? <laughs> Jonathan, you're the student ministry pastor. Raise up a team. That's what I'm doing. I'm raising up a team. I'm inviting you to be part of this intergenerational movement that is so crucial and valuable to them. I want you to work and nurture and guide and shepherd their spiritual maturity, their spiritual trajectory. And as I'm sitting with them in retreat last week and the speaker is throwing meat and milk and fire and goodness and all sorts, I realized as I was sitting behind my students watching them, praying for them, I couldn't tell who was eating at this feast or who was drinking the milk or how many of them were just plain sleeping. I mean, that will come with time, that'll come with relationship. I'm not looking at any of you in particular. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> that will come with time. But as I'm thinking about Nehemiah and our series, and I'm thinking about my students, and I'm thinking about what in the world to preach on, I'm thinking about spiritual trajectory, and I wonder if we can take a look at Nehemiah's spiritual trajectory. By the way, of which, in your worship guide, you have a great study for Ezra, because that's what I told Pastor Eddie a week ago. 
that that's what I was going to preach on. But who am I to declare what God will say and when he says it? So today we're in Nehemiah. So take that study home and have a great study on Ezra. But today we're in Nehemiah. All right. So one of my favorite ways to get deeper into Scripture is to look at the backstory, to look at all the stuff that happens in between the sentences, to try to figure out what happened before and what happened afterward, because I don't like being wrong, and since we don't actually know what happened before, and since we don't actually know what happened afterward, we can guess and imagine, and it's great, and it brings me closer to God and the Word. And so I have questions about Nehemiah. I want to know his background. In movie language, I want to know his prequel story. How did he get to chapter one? He's a fully formed adult at the height of his career in chapter one, and I want to know stuff before that because I'm a student ministry pastor. I want to know like who he hung out with as a kid. I want to know, like, was he a good guy or was he a punk? Did he have some kind of transfer? Was he Roy? <laughs> Does he have some kind of transformation story? Like, I want to know what he did for his extracurriculars. Did, like, like, maybe he was this amazing tuba player that Scripture never mentions, but it adds so much dimension. Like, what are you, Nehemiah, the tuba player? Mm. It adds flesh and depth and richness. I want to know how he was raised. I want to know what his parents were like. I want to know how much of their faith culture they translated and gave to him. Remember, he's in exile. Remember, they're living as a captive nation. They're basically slaves. And yet, in chapter 1, he's in this really high position of government official. He's in this really trusted, authoritative position. How'd he get there? We know from the book of Daniel that the Persians took the best and brightest of the slave nation and they re-educated them and they renamed them and they retrained and they recultured and they basically just brainwashed them into saying, don't you love being Persian? You love being Persian. We give you all the great food. We give you all the great money. We give you all the great positions. You love being Persian. Don't be Jewish. Be Persian. And so there's no reason not to think that that's what happened to Nehemiah. Certainly intelligent, certainly some of the best and brightest, certainly must have gone through some of that re-education process. But here's the thing. If you're a king, artist Xerxes, and you have an opening for a personal bodyguard and a personal poison tester, do you choose an enemy combatant from your slave nation, from your captive nation, for the people that you're oppressing? That doesn't seem like the best of ideas. And so there must have been something about Nehemiah that got him past the background check and the lie detector test. And all. I mean, this guy was basically head of the Secret Service. Nehemiah was the personal bodyguard for King Artaxerxes. He was the, the, the shield of poison against him. So I guess my question is, how do you do that? Like, if it, he must, his integrity must have been unimpeachable. Or he identified completely as Persian. And he left his home life behind. Um, whenever I move into, whenever I get a new, a new, I move into a new church, a new youth group, or I have a group of rising students, there's always this sequence of questions, and it, and it, it really amuses me. They ask, Jonathan, so like, we want to get to know you better, so like, you know, what are you? And we're like, I'm a youth pastor. <laughs> no, you know what we mean. Like, you know, where are you from? California. No, like, where are you, like, from? Oh, I was born in St. Louis. Come on, where are you from? What are you? My parents? Like, what are you asking? Like, I know that they're asking what my ethnicity or what my culture is. And there's two different things, by the way. And it's kind of funny, like in my house, I am the middle child. I identify as Asian American because I don't speak any Cantonese or Mandarin, and no one who does really considers me Chinese. 
Um, and yet my little sister, born and raised in the same house with the same parents in the same neighborhood, actually speaks Mandarin, actually went to China to live for a few years. And so when she and I are together at home with my mother, she and my mother start speaking in Mandarin just to be annoying. <laughs> it's like they're talking about me. So I, I mean, the only Cantonese and Mandarin I know are food words. <laughs> so as they're talking, I just randomly yell out food words. <laughs> as if I'm part of the conversation. Oh yeah, bok choy, yeah. Uh, dim sum, that's good, yeah. Bulgogi, let's, let's do that, yeah. And it's just, there's a hyphen in my identification. I'm not truly Asian, not truly Anglo, I'm Asian American. I wonder if Nehemiah was Persian or Jewish Persian. We don't know. But I ask these, I want to know these kind of things. How did he identify? There's something about being home, where everything's just right. We're surrounded by people we love and trust. There's a feeling of stability and safety. And while some people get to experience this kind of home, Many do not. Others might even be forced to leave their home and go live in a foreign land. We call this going into exile. Yeah, in exile, everything is disoriented. You're in the unknown. And in the story of the Bible, this is where the ancient Israelites found themselves, conquered by Babylon, living in exile far from their homeland. And so they had to ask themselves, how did we end up here? And is there any hope of going home? And the whole story of the Bible is designed to address those very questions. The whole story? Really? Yeah, go back to the first pages of the Bible. Where does humanity live? Okay, they live in this really sweet garden, their home. And they're there on one condition, that they trust and follow God's one command, and they don't. And so the consequence is banishment from the garden. Ah, they're sent into exile. Exactly. And so this story has been designed to set you up for Israel's story, how they were given the gift of the promised land and were able to stay there on one condition, that they be faithful to the terms of their covenant relationship with God. Um, they didn't, and they were sent into exile. And if you still don't see the parallel between exile from the garden and exile from Israel, think about this. In Genesis, humanity's exile led up to the story about the building of what city? Oh yeah, Babylon. The same place the Israelites are sent. But that's not the end of either story. In the first Babylon, God called Abraham to leave and travel to the Promised Land. And that story was designed to give hope to the Israelites currently living in the later Babylon. Now eventually, they do get to leave and travel back to their promised homeland. And when they did, it wasn't home sweet home. Oppressive empires were still ruling over them, and the people kept acting in the same corrupt ways as their ancestors. And so the biblical prophets said that exile wasn't actually over. How could they think they were still in exile when they're at home? Yeah, this is really important. In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel's Babylonian exile became an image of something more universal. It's that feeling of alienation and longing for something more, no matter where you live. Yeah, I, I can relate to this. I have a great home, but it's situated in a world scarred with pain and broken relationships, death, and tragedy, done by others, but also done by me. And so in the Bible, exile is the human condition. We all keep repeating this pattern of human corruption leading to a Babylon that we can't escape. And it doesn't matter where you live, we are all longing for a better home. Exile is a human condition. Exile is a human condition. As we look at the spiritual trajectory of Nehemiah, we don't know what he felt or what he thought. We don't know how much in exile he really felt. We just get chapter one. He's living his life, and then a friend starts to talk to him. But I wonder, if we define exile as being, let's put it in today's language, uh, just being distant from God, 
Maybe some of us today, maybe we don't welcome God into our life, and so by definition, we're distant from God. You're not anti-God, you're just, this is not your thing. You're, you're in exile. Maybe some of you are unaware that God is actually calling to you and wants to be with you, and because you haven't ever heard that before, you're, by definition, distant from God, you're in exile. And there are some of us who are just actively opposed to any presence of God in our life. And so we are in exile. And the rest of us are just waiting. And we are in exile. We don't know how much Nehemiah felt or where he was. But we do know, because chapter one is coming in his life, we do know that there was more to his life that God had in mind. And if you find yourself, by your own definition, in exile, then we know that God has more in store for your life, that there is chapter one coming, that there are more chapters coming. Would you identify yourself when you, you're meeting someone and you know, your conversation goes as normal, and the question always comes up, what do you do, right? Do you say, oh, I am a Christian architect, or I'm a Christian teacher, or I'm a Christian janitor, or I'm a Christian, yeah, what, I don't get, what, what, do you, what, do you, what are you? <laughs> you're just, oh, you're an architect, right? Oh, okay, weird person, all right. Yeah. It sounds weird to us. We don't identify ourselves that way. Students, it's like the equivalent of having, do you have any God presence in your social media at all? Is it in your bio? Is it in your post? Is there anything of God in your online presence? By the way, you should, and please do. But to our ears, that whole Christian thing, it just sounds weird to us. It just sounds like, well, it just sounds something. I don't, it doesn't sound right. And so it kind of makes me wonder, how much in exile we all are. How much do we love the culture that is keeping us enslaved and apart from God? How aware are we of the plight and the oppression of God's people? How many of us can say that God has given us our chapter one, our calling, our burden? At some point, each of us, maybe right now, have known this stage of the spiritual trajectory of exile. But thankfully, chapter one does come for Nehemiah. And I wonder again in the background story, like how did that, like, how much did he know? Like how much was he like waiting for it? Was it building in him? Was God sending him like this? Or was it just like a one time, like, Hey, by the way, Nehemiah, buddy, did you know that Jerusalem was kind of in ruins? What? That's incredible. Like, was he just protected the whole time? Or were there little parts of him building up? Did God build him up a little bit? I want to know, the, someone write this movie and like show it to me. Like, How did he get to this place where he became convicted? There is a need. There is a cause. There is a purpose that I feel God is pulling me towards, and I must, I must do something about it. I must leave my elevated position of high authority and privilege and luxury and riches, and I will go and do this thing that God has me to do, and it is very different. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what, but I will do it. We know from reading Nehemiah chapter 2 and forward, Nehemiah didn't have this all planned out when he made this decision. All he knew was that God was asking him to do something. All he knew was that he felt an undeniable urge to do and to go and to be and to act. First it was just talk to the king, just get permission to go. And then he got bold and said, hey, by the way, will you like fund this whole thing? Will you like give us everything we need for this? 
And then he's like, oh, well, I'll add, I'll just become a civil engineer then because I'm a bodyguard. I know what I'm doing. I'll just be a, I'll just be a civil engineer because that's what God's asked me to do. I'll help build a wall. And then he became like, they, they had to go to war. He had to become a military tactician because like, actually that wasn't his, he was a bodyguard, so I guess that wasn't his profession. But how many times did God just say, and next, and next, and next? He didn't give it to all at once. How many heroes in scripture got to serve in their chosen line of work? How many heroes in scripture got to stay at home in comfort? Adults, raise your hands. How many of you have changed careers at least once? Students, watch this. Twice. Three times? Students, these are people you want to talk to because these have, they have amazing stories and you should figure this out. So, middle schoolers, no one's asking you to know what, what club or activity you want to study in high school, what you want to do in high school. And high school students, when we ask you where you want to go to college and what you want to do as adults or when you grow up, we're not saying, hey, choose the one path that means everything. We're just saying, hey, what do you want to do first? What's your first step? What's your next step for the rest of us? What's our first step? What's our next step? How do we help you get there? When uh, I'm with the students, I separate them into chat groups. I stop talking for a little bit. I give them a whole bunch of questions. There's a bunch of easy ones at the top. Everyone's talking. Everyone's having a good time. And then it gets a little deeper as they get to the second and third questions. Everyone's talking about it. And then I sneak in like a challenge question at the bottom where it's like it's heavy thinking, like they've got to really reveal something vulnerable. And then at that point, they usually stop talking. But I keep trying. The challenge question is this. How many of us can tell very clearly that we have a chapter one calling from God? What is it? If we asked you, and I won't, no, I won't. I thought about it. No, I won't. Uh, could you in 30 seconds tell your neighbor, this is my calling, this is my burden, this is my passion, this is what drives me, this is what gives me joy, this is what satisfies me, this is what gets me up in the morning, this is what God made me to do right now. And that may change over the course of your life, but right now, this is what he has for me to do. I keep getting offered weird church pastor positions, things I never want to do, like executive pastor. I don't ever want that job. A small church asked, offered me their senior pastor position. I said, why? What are you thinking? <laughs> Didn't look at my resume. Um, I will live and die for the cause of students connecting with a God who loves them. I don't care what it is I do in my life, it's probably gonna be a pastor of some kind, but that's what I am made to do, that's what I'm going to be doing. You cannot sway me from my course, because I tried. <laughs> I had a bad experience with the church. I got burned hard, I got tired. And I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna serve God from the outside, I'm not gonna be a pastor. I'm not gonna work with students, and I tried. I tried for a long time to not be a pastor, and it hurt. It felt like I was dying. It felt like God was just looking at me, staring at me the whole time, just like, I know what you are doing. You are not, hey, Jonah, come back. I just felt like this was wrong, like I was being disobedient to God. You have this calling, yes? This is not a message of guilt or like, hey, you, should, you don't have this, what's wrong with you? This is, hey, let's help you find this. It will take a lot of prayer. It will take a lot of scripture. It will take a lot of community, but we will help you find this conviction, this calling, this burden, this first step, this chapter one. In your spiritual trajectory, is there this landmark thing that says, go this way, be this. I am God and I am asking you because I have made you this way. I have gifted you this way. I am going to give you incredible joy. Do it this way. I didn't know when I became a pastor, I didn't know that it would make me move all over the country. 
I didn't know that the way that I was going to be a pastor, I didn't know that that meant that I was going to be choosing singleness for a very long time. I didn't know that churches were sinful and could really hurt people. I didn't know that I could be that sinful and prideful and arrogant in a church and hurt people. But I cannot give up my conviction, my calling. We cannot be swayed from our path. Nehemiah, in his opposition, was not swayed from his path. I didn't also know how much endless joy I would get from hanging out with students and playing board games and eating and going to retreats on really bad mattresses with really bad food. I didn't know how much joy I would get from the high school dating life because it's hilarious. I did not know how much I had in store for me that God would lead me to Sonia and Sydney and Colin and have me fall in love with them even more than my beloved students. I didn't know the endless joys in front of me. Students, what we are saying is that first step you're not going to know everything, and that's okay. And yes, the second and third step may be hard, but so are the joys. So are the rewards. It is worth it. There is nothing better for you than being inside his will, his desire, his pathway for you. G.K. Chesterton, and students, you should bookmark him. When we talk about the heroes of faith, you have to include G.K. Chesterton. He has this quote that I love. He says, the problem with Christianity is not that it has been tried and found wanting. The problem with Christianity is that it's been found difficult and left untried. Don't, under, don't underestimate what God can do through you. Take your first step. Any one of us here would love to help you with that. Let's run. Um, in the end, the end part of uh, Nehemiah's trajectory, there's a weird tone shift. This was really meant to be the whole message. There's a weird tone shift in chapter 13. He spends 12 chapters giving us paragraphs and paragraphs of stories and narrative and all this great rich detail. And he gets to chapter 13. He's been away for a little while. He comes back and it's just short and terse and sort of frustrated and upset. And it's just, hey, God, you know, I tried this, and then they did that, so I fixed it. And then, God, I tried this, and I fixed that too. And there's no joy. There's no hope. It doesn't match his earlier chapters. It's like he's come back, and he's old and tired. And like he's worn out. And like we're at his spiritual tra trajectory of it's completed. His, he did what he was supposed to do, but it's not like Pastor David with celebration and joy and a vision and a, and a focus for where we're going next with a sense of completion of, yes, you have done this well. There's this sense in Nehemiah that is just sort of, God, I'm tired. Can I be done with this? It's like he's missing the key part. scriptures held out hope that one day God would send a king who would rescue the world from all of the Babylons we've created. And after many generations pass, we meet this Israelite named Jesus of Nazareth. He wandered about with no home, announcing the great restoration, that reality of home that Israel and all humanity has been looking for. Yeah, Jesus really cared about people who didn't have homes. He welcomed in the stranger. He said, God's love is shown when you invite in the outcast and throw parties for people who don't have a place to belong. Jesus also claimed that Israel and all humanity had lost its way, that our self-centeredness drives us to create false homes based on status and power, and these inevitably exclude others. We live in an exile of our own making. But Jesus said the true way home is one of weakness, of service, and of forgiveness. And then, Jesus went into exile alongside us to show us the true way home. Which is? Well, Jesus said he is the way. His life and self-giving love proved more powerful than humanity's failure. 
he opened up a pathway to our real home. And as Jesus' followers committed themselves to him, they discovered this new way of being human. They believed that the real return from exile had begun. And so they would call themselves sojourners or wanderers. Oh right, they would say things like, the world isn't our home and we're citizens of heaven. And so Jesus' followers remain exiles as they wait for that day when Jesus returns to transform this world into a true home. We don't know Nehemiah's prequel. We don't know his sequels. I want to know. Did his tone shift again? Was there rebirth and a renewal and rejoicing somewhere at the end? We don't know. Maybe you're in exile. Maybe you're in conviction. Or maybe like chapter 13, you're done, but not so much in a good way. But again, we know from the rest of the books of the Old Testament and the New Testament and Jesus Christ and the church today that God was not done with Nehemiah's story. And he is not done with your story and that your trajectory has more to go. There are more chapters for you. We would love to help you with that. We would love to help you take next steps into your chapter as we as Pathways take steps into our next chapters. We are not done. He is still coming. He is still here. There is more for us to do. We will do this together. We will not be swayed. So, like Nehemiah did when he first started inviting others into his calling, I invite you into this calling of being adults with the students together in community. I share this calling with you, you share your calling with us, and we will find the intersect and we will rejoice, just like Ezra and Nehemiah, see I fit Ezra in there somewhere, Ezra and Nehemiah together. But like Nehemiah did, let us pray that God sees us and remembers us. And let us pray that he continues to live through us in such a way that his name is made great. Let's walk together in our spiritual journey together to our next chapter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the God of journeys, the God of, oh, I'm sorry for the pun, the God of pathways, <laughs> the God who takes us from one step to the next. Father, I pray for those who feel stuck in their step. I pray for those who are missing their step. I pray for those who have gotten distracted from that step, from that calling, that purpose, that drive, that love. I pray for those unaware. I pray for those opposed. I pray for those just kind of blasé, that you might flood their lives with care and love and calling and significance and purpose and joy, God. And we as a community ask that you would not forget about us, God, that you would, just like you did for the Jews, continue to call us forward into our next steps, into whatever it is you have for us here in Gaithersburg, here in Montgomery County, here in this place of America, here in the globe, here on earth while we wait in exile for you, God. We pray for stories when we are finally done for it to be of joy and celebration and completion. Make this true of all of us and each of us, God. And all the people of God said, Amen.